The biggest reason so many of you struggle with negative feedback is you over are excited when you get positive feedback. That's the unlock, my friends. The unlock is what's made you vulnerable is the addiction to the positive reinforcement. You're so beautiful, you're so beautiful, you're so beautiful, you're ugly. That's devastating. You're so great, you're so great, you're so great. You make a bad decision in business, you go back a step, you fucking are a loser, we knew you were bullish. You got it? It's that. It's really fun. I'm telling you guys, help me. Come with me on this fucking journey. Put your two fucking index fingers in your ear, hear nothing from nobody ever, and fucking live in happiness forever. And let there be no confusion. I do not sit up here naive and, and I do not understand that that's not so easy if your whole framework was always to get affirmation. I'm just telling you the unlock. Whether that's therapy, whether that's running, whether that's yoga, whether that's a different diet, whether that's cutting out people in your life that are trying to tear you down and always will because misery loves company is a saying for a fucking reason. And so, I don't know what you are or what it is, but I promise you this. The second you surround yourself with optimism instead of negativity, good shit happens. And it's funny to watch cynical negative people when I talk about this. (laughs) Gary, no, 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 I'm just keeping it real. I'm like, real fucking negative, dick. (laughs) You're keeping it real fucking negative. I think the literally the most disgusting trait in a human being is cynicism. It's devastating. If you look at everything with like, what's gonna go wrong, like what are they up to, how are they gonna get, like, it's a devastating way to live. I love when people let me down. I don't know if it, what was it, Bronx Tale? Is that the one where the fucking mobster tells the kid that kid owes him, right, is that it? Yeah, bro, that's the best fucking scene ever. I live my life that way. I love when people fucking let me down. I'm like, good, next. <laughs> like, like, people are so insecure. Like, oh, that person got me. He didn't get you, she didn't get you. They got themselves. You're in control of never doing anything with them again. I, I give trust, I give trust from the second I meet you. I trust every single person in here on some real shit. And then I watch for you to take it away. Old school, all the old school Russians around me, they're like, you gotta earn trust. I'm like, why? Why don't you give it to them first and go the other way? Everyone's on fucking defense. Everyone's fucking scared. What? You got caught? You got clowned? Based on who? The person that does wrong shit is the clown. You're strong. You're strong when you give somebody love and respect up front. Besides, you know, coming because you appreciate me, which means a lot to me, what means a lot more to me is like, what can I talk about tonight that will actually get you to start doing? This is only a game about doing. Everything we talk about, like, I've given you the black, like people are like, you never talk about, Gary, you just talk motivational bullshit, like, you don't, give me some fucking strategy, some details, I'm like, I do. I give the, here's the single best piece of advice I could ever give. Watch what I do and do it. I do nothing by accident. There's nothing I'm doing for kicks and giggles. Nothing. Like, zero. I I wanna do texting, it's probably a good idea for you to figure out how to get a text number to do something with. I'm not doing it because it's fun. I'm not doing it because it's clever. I'm not guessing out here so you can make fun of me for doing it in seven years. So the, the strategy is basic. Contextual, creative, at scale, in places that are underpriced. TikTok and LinkedIn are underpriced. You need no money, zero. You start an account, you make something with your phone, you post it. But Gary, you have a huge team and fucking DRock and all this, but I didn't for seven and a half years and I did it all by myself. You don't talk about that. Like, I just, like, help me figure out which excuse you want to use, because I'll give you the answer, but way more importantly, help me what you're scared of. 
You're scared that somebody anonymous is gonna say you don't look good, so it takes you seven hours of makeup and lighting to get a post up? Because fucking Ricky Pants 7 is gonna say you're ugly? (laughs) Is that where we're at? Because I'm gonna save you time, that's where we're at. You know? (laughs) Fuck you, Ricky is right. (laughs) And especially when Ricky is your mom, When Ricky's your mom, that's when it's really fuck you time. The biggest thing I learned by reading these hundreds of thousands of messages is, and it's continuously why I'm so grateful, is right. Unfortunately, like my father, but fortunately for me, not like me, there's a lot of moms out there that make people feel bad. I get it. I've lived it my whole life. I've watched my grandma and my dad's relationship. I know what mine was, which was the opposite. I understand how we're completely different. I'm, I know why I'm fearless. I'm not scared of anybody or anything because I'm in my own head, that's where I live, and that's it. It's also, it's also why when I get admiration or stopped or all this, I don't hear that either. You're so humble, Gary. It's because I know I don't mean anything. You know what's the most amazing feeling? is when you think you're the best and you know you mean nothing. That's why I'm so happy. It is. I think I'm great. I think I got a lot in me. I think I can leave some real fucking legacy shit. I'm looking for November 14th to be a national holiday when I die, my birthday. That's right. I'm looking for that shit. That's where I'm aiming. I'm like, fuck it. If Abraham Lincoln can have it, fuck it. I want it too. But I also know that God forbid, if I'm ghost tomorrow, cool, I'll probably get a solid eight hours on social of some serious love, and then what? We're living through it right now, one of the great, iconic, like, it's already getting quieter. Show me how much we're talking about Kobe in 60 days. Life moves on. Life moves on. That's just the world. No matter who you are, that's how it goes, right? When you think about the legacy of all the people we, we admire over the last decade, right? You get to the Oscars and this stuff and they play Remember and you're like, oh shit, right. Right? So like, that's the power. Like, what makes me, what makes me roll my fuel is humility. You see the bravado in the way I communicate, that's fucking Jersey. I can't help that I'm from Jersey. That's Jersey. That's where I get that from. But let that not confuse the words that are coming out of my mouth. This is about humility. Of course it's easy to navigate when you're not worried about other people's opinions. Of course. I don't do any email at all, which is how I do my work when I'm actually working. The only time I do email is when I fly. Even though it's what I'm supposed to do. Because when I'm on the ground, that's the time to do this. So your answer and your advantage is time. You need to outwork the people that have money. There's three variables, three pillars. Time, money, talent. Talent is hard to control. Um, Money you don't have yet. Time is your only friend. What you do between 7 p.m. and three in the morning will ultimately probably be the variable of your success. Now if you lack talent, you can work for the rest of your life, you're not gonna win. So you need to be smart about that. And then there's the strategy of what you're building. If you're building a piece of shit, you've lost. But the thing that's most controllable in sales is time. So you were doing what? I was marketing director for a big company. Got it, and you decided to start your own brand. Awesome, and so what's happening? Going very well. Good. So what, what next? Yeah, but the thing, sometimes you want to get people around you say, well, you're 48, you're starting your business now. Um, Sounds like losing players. <laughs> is that good enough? No, no, it's fine. It's your big thing. Sometimes you doubt yourself, but not doubting yourself. I get you it. Know what you want to do, but yes, you are 48. Here's what's happening. It's interesting because you're you're <laughs> you're very interesting to me. Here's why. You either were an entrepreneur and you suppressed it to do the practical thing and work in corporate America, or you were kind of maybe 50-50, right? Like you had safety, but you also, like you had entrepreneurial tendencies. You weren't 100% pure, like for me, I would die. You know, like I can't breathe if I'm not entrepreneuring. And I mean, since I was like nine. I mean, that's why I got very bad grades in school. This wasn't 
it's cool now. I was disaster in school and the immigrants got A's. That's how you got out, you know? So what's interesting is the reason you're letting outside forces seep in is because you're not, when you're 100%, you don't give a fuck. You're crazy to begin with. The whole thing's crazy, right? So if you're in between, I would tell you this. Let the results and the way you feel speak. The last people you should be listening to is anybody else. If you feel it. You know what I mean? I mean, now, if your whole circle, if your spouse, if your parents, if your siblings, if your best friends are all pushing, hey, hey, it can get hard. What I would say is find an outlet for support. Keep hanging out with these people, right? Offset the voices. You need the other voices. Watch content from other people. You know, like, but it is a, it is a black, like, if you need that, so I don't. I don't consume anything because I don't need ideas or reformation or motivation from anything. I keep insular. But if you're feeling it, and I understand, because you're practical, right? You feel like you feel a huge sense of responsibility. And so you're always thinking, what could go wrong? I would remind you a couple things. Did you have a fairly successful corporate career being a marketer? Good. This is going, how long has this been going? And how's it going? Good. It sounds like you're just a winner. And so if you happen to lose here, which we all do, I have a funny feeling you're gonna be able to go get a job. No shit, that's why you did it. But you have to understand upside versus downside. The upside is you build a whole life around something you wanna do and it's the best. And you make more money and you're happy and you're doing your thing. The downside is the other thing you left. So as long as you're not worried about what everybody says about you losing here, if you have to go back, then you're risking nothing. I get very upset when people um, try to suppress people from hard working without realizing that that's what makes that person happy. And you know, whether it's me or Jason Fried and, and DHH, like I think we actually agree on most things. I think the thing we probably would I'm curious in a sit down is, you know, is it up to us to know when Dan or Johnny or Susan are on the verge of burnout and or do we know, like telling people like you should work 40 hours a week or 160 hours a week eliminates knowing what they're about. I don't know what to say. I, I think none of us get to sit on an ivory tower and tell people what to do. You know, do I believe that hard work is an essential part of the kind of success that people define? I do. Do I think working so many hours that it burns you out that you need to retire or quit or you're unhappy in perpetuity is bad? Of course I do. I think this is a self-awareness game and actually I think it's a much more interesting game of like do you know why you're working or what are you trying to achieve? I would go crazy sitting on a farm in middle America or doing 28 weeks of vacation. It's not what makes me happy but I unbelievably am happy for the people that makes it happy. I love the process of building something the way I want to build it. I would go crazy having all people working remotely the way 37 Signals does. They would go crazy managing a thousand people under a roof. I think it's about self-awareness. Look, I think that you always have to sleep in the bed that you make. And so I'm aware that I've been disproportionately passionate over the last decade around hustle and hard work, right? Like, you know, when I wrote uh, Crush It, there was so much of that in 2009. I thought there was an amazing opportunity of the internet, YouTube, social Mm -hmm. media. That was true. People benefit from it, both of you, many who are watching. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think it's sad when you get to a place in your career where you can drive traffic for others by just the sheer mention of. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's not fun to be the subject of articles or keynotes where people are taking things and not painting. It's bandwagoning. Yeah, yeah, it's just not the full picture. uh, It's very clear if you read or watch anything Mm -hmm. for even more than five minutes that I want people to be happy and be self-aware. Do I believe that work ethic is a foundational piece of success? Yes, I do. Do I want anybody ever to work so much that they get depressed? Of course not. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I never think that money is the driver. And so I think, I think whether it's lazy headline reading or not doing homework, yeah, it's it's not been it's not been the most fun to get dragged yeah. into. No, like, yeah, I, I was like, oh, I found reading. 
no and there, there's so many people who are proof of the words that you say me included um so so yeah it's like oh man, it's, it's, just, it's listen just there's much. a there's a byproduct of success yeah you know mm -hmm. where people will you know hustle porn is a term leverage poor is a term hmm. Leveragepreneur is when you're using other people to build yourself up at the cost of the other person. And you know, I think that though, you know, as you get bigger, people will leverage you. And I'm okay with that because the truth always wins in the end. And you know, I know the body of work that I put out, my intent. Um, and if you wanna clip one thing or one definitive statement from one talk without the context of the whole thing, of course you can say anybody says anything. Mm -hmm. But the reality is is that, you know, I, uh, I believe work ethic is important if you want to achieve hyperbolic success. I don't want to tell people how to be happy. Yeah. So why are you telling me how I should be happy? My job. Uh, and there's plenty of people that are super depressed that work 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just hyperbolized link baiting, leverage penuring, and I'm okay with that. But at the same token, it's important not to uh, not take other people's points of view into account. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm in a constant, you know, focus of that as well. And honestly, by the way, I'm getting a lot more seven and six, seven and eight than anybody would imagine. And on weekends, I'll go eleven. I think sleep is now deep. we're getting the truth. Yeah. Okay, you know, so I... you actually give yourself a lot of recovery. What I'm doing is Monday through Friday. No question, the that game can be six and you know and, and, and seven. And when I play basketball, it could be even a little earlier because we have a six a.m. tip off, so I have to get up at five thirty. But but I almost consistently will try to make up time Friday night to Saturday, Saturday night to Sunday, Sunday. Like I just don't know. Like it's just I'm a big believer. That's all. Yeah. But now I'm not worried about what people, how much sleep they get. I'm worried about what they do while they're awake. I think accountability is number one. I am baffled by leaders' ability to blame everybody but themselves. If you're a leader by nature, everything is your fault. And so I take accountability in everything that's happened in my personal life, and my professional life, and everything in between. And so it doesn't mean, I mean, I have plenty of feelings in my personal and professional life of like what the other parties had to do. Uh, and, and, but I don't spend time on blame or dwelling the number one characteristic of a, a, a winner, leader, is, uh, is accountability. I think compassion and empathy is the next. The reason I hold no grudges is I understand why. And so I think compassion and empathy mixed in with accountability. I think competitiveness is a major factor. I think the world has demonized competition in the last 30 years in a very unfortunate way. I think eighth place trophies actually lead to a lot of anxiety and depression with children, now 20 and 30 year olds, not the reverse. Merit matters, and so I think competitiveness matters, tenacity, ambition. Uh, these are kind of the hard, soft skills, and then on the soft, soft skills, it's definitely kindness, empathy, caring, being sweet, approachable. Like, I just don't understand how people don't know that likability is a direct correlation to something that's healthy. What does that, how does that show up for a founder? I'm gonna turn it back towards a day one, you yep. know, very focused topic, right? Someone who's a solopreneur, they're in their own head, they don't have a team, but they obviously have people. How does that come home for somebody who's starting a business? When you're kind to your vendors, to your potential customers, to the customers that fired you, you win. See, it's, it, the big problem is that people say like, I'm kind, and then I, double click into it with a founder that I'm an investor in or a leader in my company as I go, you're kind when it's easy. Right? Next year it's gonna be hard. The economy's getting softer. There's a lot going on. Like, are you kind when it's rough? Right, how does it show up for a solopreneur? Solopreneur is scared. She and he are scrapping. They're trying to get by. They don't wanna go back to their job. So when you're scared and scrapping, the ability to be I'll give you an example. You're a solopreneur, you got a customer. They're paying you a thousand bucks a month. You're pumped. They fire you a month in because they have a problem. Are you gonna be kind and gracious to them or are you gonna be like, fuck you? Most people go to fuck you. I think if you go to kind and gracious and understanding, even though it's a gut punch to you, that that comes around long term and it matters.
man, I just want to ask everybody because I'm like looking in the mirror. <laughs> That's so real. <laughs> and, and life is getting harder, right? The, the economy is getting harder. We're all going to face that. Let me, get, let, me give, let me give you a super macro one. You being kind in every scenario on the way to your ship sinking is exactly how you're gonna get a meaningful job on the other side of your failed startup and people just don't look at the bigger picture. A friend of mine, Tom Bellew, on a podcast with me, looked me dead in the face, rocked me, rocked me, because it's true. Very similar to how you pegged me with you know, EQ and work ethic. He rocked me, he goes, do you know what your superpower is? I'm already pumped, I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> like what is it? I'm like, what is it? And you know, and usually in those moments, I think he's gonna say something like, "Work ethic and EQ would not surprise me." That I'm super understand. But he looked at me, he goes, "Your superpower, and I've, and you have this more than anybody I've ever seen. Your ability to not judge yourself is remarkable." And that's my answer. Every day, my ambition is insane. If I decide to sleep all 24 hours in the next 24 hours, I'm thrilled. It's a, it's, it's, it is the combination of those two. I love what I do, and if today, like my ability, like, and this gets into a singular voice mentality. Because I don't think most people are actually judging themselves either. I think they're taking the voices of others to allow themselves to be judged. People are like, Gary, I hear you, but what if you're, you know, they're like, I get it, don't listen to others, but what if your own voice, the one in your own head is telling you you suck shit, or this, that, and the other thing, I'm like, you've taken on the voice of someone else. I really believe that. And for some reason, through self-esteem, serendipity, and many other things, very, I mean, I consciously, in third grade, decided to not try in school. Not because I was the normal third grader, because I definitely wasn't. It was because I was like, fuck, this has nothing to do with my life. And I'm gonna start working on my actual skill. And I'm willing to deal with the judgment of my teachers, do you know how not fun it is to grow up your whole life and have your, all your friends' parents think you're a loser? Because the only framework in society at that time is your school grades. I think more kids have to learn how to be in a framework of adversity. Because the alternative is why we have so much sadness, which is parents are creating fake environments, kids have no adversity, and everything's taken care of in one way or the other, whether through financial or delusion and then they go into the real world and mommy and daddy aren't around anymore, are they? So here's the question. I want to grow my practice by persuading therapists and coaches to follow a more customer-friendly model, which I think the session model, overcharging and billing for hours. I can't find people to do this. How do I go about doing that? By pounding the narrative into the universe at scale. I couldn't find entrepreneurs that wanted to be empathetic <laughs> and kind to their, their VCs, their employees, their vendors, and then I just made seven trillion pieces of creative over a 10 year period, and all miraculously you find more. And at first it was dozens, and then it was hundreds, and then it was thousands. Every single person here that wants something accomplished has to realize that scaled creative in social channels, and then doing unscalable work, I see Greg S in here, right, who's uh, behind HiHo, that Q&A platform leads to depth like I've never seen, which is why I decided to get behind it. Um, and so, you know, there's depth, there's width, but it's all about creative. Like, you know, the world was changed by writers, by poets, by musicians, by public speakers. Everyone here can have the world they want. The problem is, most people that are trying to do good or optimism are quieter than people that are trying to do negativity and bad. Negativity and darkness and bad is loud. They're on the offense. Positivity and happiness is content, thus not pushing themselves to be loud. One of the biggest things that I'm trying to do is be loud in the face of negativity, right? I see Vicky, one of my favorites, Vicky J, just like that. Like, like in the face of anything and everything, I always want to go positive and do good. And I'm empathetic to people's feelings, but I'm always going to push positive things because it is positive. Life is complicated, there's a lot of variables, there's a lot of nuances, but positivity in this room needs to be louder. And so if he wants that, the reason he's not finding it is he's not putting it into the universe enough. More creative, more written word, more audio, more video, more jumping into me saying yes to this. I had these 30 minutes 
as if, like I would have rather have somebody take a razor and slash my face than allocate the 30 minutes to this, given how much work I have to do before January 1st. And yet I said yes to this because intuitively I felt that I could leave a positive impact in these 30 minutes to somebody within the 2,000 people that are sitting here right now and I was like, fuck it. And so it's painful and like, after I hang up, I'm like, fuck, I really probably needed that 30 minutes. But then in nine months, 16 months, four years, somebody here is gonna email me and say, I was listening to Twitter Spaces, you said something about accountability or kindness, and it changed my life, and then all of a sudden, it's all fucking pro. Somebody asked me um, on Instagram after I posted this, Gary, if the mindset has been skewed, how can you bring it back? And I answered with, by surrounding yourself with people who have the mindset you aspire to. My friends, please understand that mindset is controllable in the same way that all our opinions are controllable. The key is to add more people with optimism and cut people with negativity. It's very, very simple. Now it's very hard to cut people with pessimism, cynicism, and negativity when they are the people that are the closest to you. Parents, siblings, spouse, but the bottom line is, if you're asking the question, I'm gonna give you the answer. The answer is add more people with positivity and optimism and cut people with pessimism and cynicism. Who you surround yourself matters. What content you consume matters. I basically suffocate myself for a long period of my time and created an environment that was based on offense and optimism and now I know no different. Please do the same for you. Make that move. Mold, and I mean mold, your mindset by what you consume and with whom you consume. Like, what are your thoughts when you're trying to figure out yourself and you have to kind of deal with the baggage in your life? Like, you know, I never hear you talk about counseling or anything like that, so I'm just wondering, like, kind yeah. of your thoughts on more about self-awareness for these guys. I'm, Look, I think people that are growing up in the best environments of all time are struggling with self-awareness at 13 and 14. Sure. I mean, 90%, 98% of my company here in their 30s and 40s and 20s have no clue on self-awareness. So here's what I would say. I would say that I'm a big fan of just eating reality. I'm just a fan of it. You know, like, like the reality was I was never, like my dad, my dad, I had my dad, but I didn't because he worked every hour. I never saw him. Missed every game, missed every, just didn't see him. Worked every hour. That was my reaction. Now I was happy, it was way better than leaving or dying or you know, it was great. But like, I didn't have him. I could have done what my other friends who have workaholic parents do and dwelled. Like, my dad's not in my baseball game. Or you don't. Look, I am not going to shortchange the extremities of all the things, you know, all the cliches. Parents, drugs, murder, mental health, like all the things. The thing that I have not figured out is how to get the universe to give a fuck. So, so to answer your question, it's amazing to see people in good situations and bad situations go through a situation and do this. Like if I could give everybody a drug, it would be optimism. Right, like if you're willing to look at all your shit, whatever it is, and, every, and by the way, everybody thinks their shit is the shit, right? Like everybody's like, every, like I've had people sit in this room one by one with me say, eh, if my dad didn't give me a hundred million dollars, I would have never been a loser because it all came too easy to me. Everybody thinks their shit's the shit because it's their life, right? People that don't have parents, and things, they laugh at that. They're like, fuck you. But that person thinks that's the shit. So it's about, you know, I don't know. The reason, I don't talk about a lot of things I don't know. I don't know how to recommend you know, you know, counseling or how to build self-awareness or mental health. I try to stay away from things that I don't know because I think that would be detrimental to the things I do know. What I will say is you know, self-aware, so I don't know how to teach self-awareness. I just know it's the most, I just know it's the game. Once you know who you are, it, it, it manifests into self-esteem. You don't actually then give a fuck what, you know, you sit here and just don't give a fuck what they say or any girl say, like, you just don't care. It's crazy when you get there. That's like the fucking ultimate. You're just fucking living life like in the matrix. You're just like running through shit. You, to actually not give up, especially at this age, that's what happened to me. I still think about it. How the fuck did I not give a fuck? 
<laughs> right? Because it's like, like in, when you're like 13, 14, 15, like your friend, that's your whole life. I just remember not caring and I just, I was just on some different shit in my head. So that's what I want for everybody. Because then you're fucking set. How do you get there? I don't know, man. That's why I don't talk, that's why I don't talk about it, right? Like I just, honestly, I swear to God, if I knew how to get there, this whole thing would be a wrap. I'd own the Jets, I'd own the world if I knew how to like get there and get people there, right? I try to get there by talking about it and maybe somebody's like, oh shit, that's kind of like me too. Let me go deeper into that. I actually do feel like that. I actually don't give a fuck. When I'm, like, I don't know, but God, it's big. Cause then peer pressure's out. Then you're just not getting dragged into anything you don't want to be doing. I wrote, my first book was called How to Cash In on Your Passion which fucked me up because then everybody kept emailing me like, what's my passion? I'm like, I don't fucking know you. Like, I don't know, like, like, I have no idea. The biggest thing you realize is a lot of people don't know or never find it or, you know, my belief is the only answer for any of them, right? For you, for anybody, is you gotta figure out how to try shit. Like, that's the only, like, like you just never know what your favorite food was until you try it. If you only had chicken, you might have not known that hot dogs were the best. So that's what I love about the internet. These kids have so much option to like watch shit on YouTube and so like my only answer to Nate or anybody like is just like just try shit. And so like that's back to opportunity. Easy to try shit when you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank and parents that take you to shit. You gotta hack the game, right? Like that's what's passionate for me about this today. This is me letting them try shit. Hear it a different way. Something could happen, who knows, maybe not. I'm willing to go 0 for 9, but you try. So like that to me, that's why I love the DM thing, right? Like, you don't think 21 Savage is hitting you back, but he might. Crazy shit happens. <laughs> People decide no before they try. So you just decided no because the system tells you no. You've been pound, you've been sold no. And by the way, not just you, the fucking world. Not tough situation. The world. Everybody's saying no. I just say yes. And then if it's a no, I don't give a fuck. You're gonna judge me that I lost? I don't give a fuck what you think. And that's why I get so into that. Because then, then you're not scared to try shit because when you don't give a fuck what anybody says about you failing, you love failing. I love losing. It is crazy. It is. Because... <laughs> It is crazy that you say that. And I, I, I love it. About it all the time because with him and, and YouTube and it's like we partner on this. You yep. know, like I hate being on camera and yep. that's like, like not my thing. So he does that and I do a lot of like social media stuff and and, um, and things like that and partnering with him. But You're thinking it, about distribution. It bums me when something doesn't work and we think it's gonna be great. And and the idea of loving the failure that I love getting up, punched in the mouth. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. What is it about the failure that that love that you love or that I want to pr- it it makes me want to stick it to everybody who judged me when they judged my fail. And that's true. I like that part. Well, that's it. I, I like it. I no no. That. I actually love it. You just kind of like it. <laughs> I don't think I understand it yet. We have you know? we yeah. haven't scored that big. I mean, yeah. Maybe this is. I get it. I get it. Like to me, it's it's um, yeah, it's like it's a chip on the shoulder. I loved being an underdog. I loved being like from Russia and not speaking English and like like being small. Like somewhere around third grade, I'm like, fuck, I'm not gonna be as good at sports as these other kids are getting real fucking tall. Like you know, just like you know, like like I just loved it and I still love it. And it's really funny now that I've made it in my little space, like. I want to do other shit. Cause I don't want to, like, as soon as I won the wine game, I left. Cause I don't want to be the top dog. I don't want people trying to get me. I want to try to get them. You know? I love the grind. I love, you, you, you like that? <laughs> that's, tough. that's tough, that's tough. It's real shit too because it's like, when you at the top, it's like, there's nowhere else to go. It's it like, sucks. Everybody is right at your neck, but when you always reaching for the top, then it's like that constant grind. And I gotta tell you, man, and I'm telling you, my friend, this. This is the operating system of the universe. This is the only thing that matters. This is the only thing that matters. The attention on this is the game. And like that just, and every, like you could make an Instagram account. Like go ahead. Go, like this one kid I'm watching on Musical.ly went from zero to a hero in four minutes, five videos.
Or, or, or they just worked, right? Like I would tell you straight up, I didn't fail a whole lot other than school because I, I knew that's what I was not gonna do. It's just that people don't realize that LeBron fucking took 4,000 shots yeah. in a day in fourth grade. You know, like, 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 what do you think they're doing? Like, you, listen, you guys know, this is what I saw at Mount Ida. I was like, fuck man, some of these kids are athletic freaks. But then they were just smoking blunts all day. I was like, oh, that's why didn't they make, <laughs> no, now I understand. They weren't waking up at 5.30 in the morning, running, fucking hitting the gym, and then shooting for nine hours a day. All, all my, like two, 50% of the kids in my suite, 301, they're like, I'm gonna be a rapper. Like, they didn't write all day. They never tried to get into studio. Like, they didn't do shit. They talked shit. Gotta do. Worst thing you can do is do nothing. Pondering, complaining, dreaming. It's one and the same. If you're dreaming or if you're complaining, it's the same shit. It means you're just not doing shit. <laughs> I'm gonna be a little naked here and talk about something I've struggled with on stage. And as Gary V, if you follow my content, this will blow your mind. I'm great at candor, right? I can be very candorous here in the q and I'm about to be very candorous, I'm candorous in this. I'm very candorous as a character on Instagram. You know, my content, I mean, just look, let me just see what I've posted recently. Like, this, this school, you know, this school video, <laughs> I'm very, very candorous. I'm very, 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 very candorous. You know, in the, as you can tell, and potty mouth, and jerseyed out. But as a manager of people, I so struggled with delivering bad news that I danced. I danced, I was a little full of shit to be frank. I couldn't deliver the, hey Rick, you suck at your job, let's fix this or this or that. I would dance, I would try to pep up, I would, I would be pep rally but I wouldn't be candorous. And then what would happen is I'd eventually be fed up and I would fire Rick and he'd be stunned because a week ago I'm like, go Rick, go, R-I-C-K, Rick, Rick, Rick. And then I'm like, and then on, you know, and then on Friday, on Tuesday, I'm cheerleading squad and on Friday I'm like, Rick, we gotta let you go. And Rick would be like, what? And I would always be anxious and I realize now why because I didn't set it up. I wasn't candorous enough. So one of my key tenets, ingredients to leadership is kind candor. I think people use candor as an excuse to be mean and to rear their insecurities and talk down to people. And so I don't love that. And which is why I call it kind candor, not candor. You have to be able to deliver feedback to people and you need to be kind about it. For example, one of the things I would say is say, look, Sally, in my opinion, and you know, unfor and I use this, unfortunately this company is mine and it's my responsibility, unfortunately, to make a subjective call. From what I've seen and what I feel, unfortunately, I don't feel like you're very strong at this and we need to talk about it. So you're, you're hedging the candor with kindness. You know, Rick, you, you're just a pleasure in this office. You're, you're bringing so much value to the office culture. You know, I'm getting some complaints from the clients that you're missing some T's and dotting, missing some dotting of I's. We need to talk about this because if that keeps happening, it's gonna be vulnerability. Should maybe you should maybe not be an account person. Maybe you want to be an HR, da, 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 or maybe you want to do something else. like kind candor. Kind candor really matters. Um, I used to use stunning people, then big severances, then you know feeling bad and like overextending myself after I would fire them. All bad behavior, all because I wasn't able to be candorous. It was a huge, huge leadership flaw of mine, and it's the one that I'm most building up right now that I'm proud of. And so kind candor, I think, is another thing that a lot of people here have to talk about. Um, I also think humility, just for a few minutes before we go into Q&A, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career. I really have, I've had a lot of accolades. You start Googling me now if you don't know, there's a lot of winning stuff out there. But having the ambition to be all time, but and equally in your body knowing you don't mean shit, is a huge thing and, and a huge, huge factor to leadership. I definitely believe that more people in my company buy into me because of my humility, which is again, I would argue my humility and my inability to have candor are the two things my content is least capable of communicating, but are two foundational things that have impacted my leadership. One, negatively, lack of candor now, 
in the last 18 months, it's exploded my kind candor and it's really helped my company. And B, humility. Like, you know, I only think I'm as good as my last at bat. So just because I invested in Facebook and Twitter and Uber and Pinterest and Snapchat and Coinbase and Venmo and had this great investing career, my next investment tomorrow might suck and could really hurt me. You know, just because I, you know, um, just because I have built this $200 million plus company, VaynerX, you know, in revenue from zero, doesn't mean tomorrow that it can't go down to 87 if I get high on my own supply and think I'm a tough guy and think I'm so great and think I'm Gary V. Humility is incredibly important and people smell it on you. And I think a lot of you could have a lot more success if you didn't need to take credit for everything that your team's doing. Their humility really matters and I think it really rears its head and I highly recommend you get into an honest place the best way to push somebody above their own means is to guilt them into it. And I know that's a weird kind of answer, but it is my honest belief that the thing that drives, first of all, everybody's driven by different things. So the real answer to your question is to use your ear, right? D-Rock, zoom in to my ear, right? You know, the ear is the key in this scenario because the truth is, the way to push somebody above their limits is to actually have individual conversations with them about what is their holy, you know, grail, right? Like, what do they want to accomplish? Like, India and I, I, I like, I have a good feel of some of India's long-term career ambitions. And like, that gives me, first of all, her knowing that we've even had that conversation in and itself gives her a little bit more confidence to work harder because she's trying to get what she wants out of it professionally and knowing that I'm the person that can most likely make that happen, at least in the context of this world, that just even having the conversation puts her in a better spot. Um, but some people are, are literally rawly driven by straight cash. Like truly, like, like you wanna push somebody? Like you carrot, like hey, I know you love cash. I'll give you 10,000 more if you like, you know like, and so you've gotta find out what makes people tick. I'm so not motivated by cash that so many people try to get me to do things, JV with me, invest in things, uh, do things, speak at things, because they, and they think cash is the, the, the way to do it. And listen, I love the cash, um, but it's not my biggest driver and I make a lot of decisions based on legacy, um, long-term impact, uh, on myself, by the way, not like long-term global impact. You know, uh, you know that's not, not how I, I think. I mean, I think there's a byproduct of that, but that's not the number one thing for me. But. To answer the question in a general form, I truly do believe the best way to get that is to guilt. And what I mean by guilt, it's a variation of listening, which is not only listening, but delivering in a world where so few people even begin to listen, let alone delivering on that listening. And once you start doing that, people start realizing, let me tell you what's happening at Vayner, it's not super confusing. I know exactly what's going on in this company. It's starting to get old enough that there's enough things happening for enough people that it's really easy to point to Phil Toronto or to somebody else and be like, wait a minute, or Steve Unwin. Like, you can start pointing to, oh crap, that person wanted that, that person's getting that, that person's happy as crap, I want that. And so, it's listening and then delivering, which then creates a scenario where people want to over-deliver because the only way somebody will over-deliver for you, because you asked a very selfish question, how can I get my team to over-deliver for me? For my thing, it's very simple. The best way to get them to over deliver, John? Jack, that's a substitute. No, Jack is not a substitute. Okay. I know where you're thinking, but okay. like, no, that is not a substitute. Okay. We're around the hundred. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the only way to get somebody to over deliver is to attack their own selfishness, theirs. You're selfish because you want more out of your team to help you. Well, the best way to get that to happen is to over-deliver against their selfishness. I do believe that guilt is a huge driver because it, there's something that I, I believe in human beings. I mean, some people don't have self-awareness or empathy or these emotional feelings, but so many people, like, it's amazing to me now living 20 years professionally, like, how many people are not confused eventually. They may be emotional at the time you fire them or not reward them, but boy, every time I run into somebody four, seven, nine years down the line, I've had a very good track record of them saying, yeah, I know why you did that, or 
I mean, like crazy stuff. Like I had a drug problem. I mean, like there was like, you know, stuff. Life, right? So, I would answer your question uh, like I have before on this show, and if you haven't heard me say it, I'll say it again. The single best way to win is to give 51% of the relationship, if there was a jury of 500 people, that they would all agree that you've given 51% to the relationship and you have to be good enough to know what to do with the other 49. Self-awareness. Yeah, you know, it took me being self-aware, challenging myself, willing to be honest with myself that, hey Gary, you think you're so great and you're so nice and you're so successful. This candor thing's a problem and it took, it took pain. It took people not liking me, which was, makes no sense because my intent is through the roof. I'm like so lucky and so well-parented that I love people. I don't need nothing from nobody. I'm on my own two feet. I ask, I, I don't need anything. And not emotionally, not financially. And yet I still had these individuals who were miffed and would talk shit about me. And I was like, God damn it, it's that candor. Um, so self-awareness, you've got to really, really deploy that. Let me, let me leave you with this sentence and we'll go right into Q&A. Every strength and every weakness you have as a leader, you're tricking no one. They know. Your employees know. Your customers know. Your employees know. And if they don't know, they themselves don't have good emotional intelligence. And I always said to my friends, you'd rather win with winners than win with losers. Right, and so like, if you're tricking people that don't know, your employees are also insecure and this is like an unhealthy relationship, cool, but you're just building an ecosystem that's gonna be small. And and more importantly, if somebody is emotionally intelligent, both on your customer side or your employee side, they're gonna see right through you. So see right through yourself first. I always say, I'd rather put myself out of business than have somebody else do it. You know, I got ahead of it and had a very heart-to-heart conversation with my company and said, look, I'm lacking candor and that's why we're B minus. We should be A plus culture because of what my intent is. I can make money elsewhere. I don't make decisions on every dollar. I'm a good guy, I want legacy, not currency. I got all this going for me, but we're B minus. That was because of this lack of candor. I'm standing up this thing called kind candor. So everybody who's in here, who's a little bit of like, a little bit of a jerk, this doesn't mean you're gonna be able to get to be a jerk. This is gonna mean that we're gonna be more candorous with each other and it's really changed my company. This is very important. In a post iOS 14.5 world, we are shifting and an emergence of the TikTokification of all social media. We are shifting in a massive, and I mean massive, shift in the way that we all grew up with social media in the last decade. It is literally going inverse. Where, and definitely knowing the way you guys and gals have invested, we, have go- we are going aggressively from a math, CAC, LTV first mentality that has some commoditized slash intrigue in the creative to a creative first affirmation from consumer interest then deploying math model. Math was at the forefront for the last decade for a lot of the companies here and definitely the ones in your portfolio, many of which did incredibly well, moved first on underpriced math. Creative art and deep segmentation work and creative that is relevant for many different segmentations to create consideration to sell your thing. Let the algorithm work what it does for its own self-interest that gives you insights to what creative is actually resonating, then refurbish that creative to something I call brand formants and allow the media to play after you confirmed the creative because you posted it organically and got the insights both quant and qual. Okay, let me say it again. What I believe almost everybody here that's selling direct to consumer or trying to drive people into store need to do, every company here without knowing a clue of if people are starting day one or are very far along, is produce somewhere in the ballpark of just guessing this room, 17 to 58 pieces of organic creative a day against 12 to 25 different consumer segmentations try to be great at that. It's, this is not spray and pray. This is not throw against the wall and see what sticks. This is not test and learn. This is market every day 
to your consumers as if it was a print or radio ad or a commercial every day, thoughtfully, put out 50 pieces of creative, watch the algorithms take them because that's where social is now. The reason I invested in Tumblr all those years ago, thank God I wasn't making videos back then. I invest in Tumblr, I have drinks with uh, David Karp, it gets locked in. I call AJ and go, AJ, three months, my brother AJ, three months earlier I invested in Twitter, six months earlier I invested in Facebook. I call AJ and go, AJ, I just invested in the company that's gonna be bigger than Facebook and Twitter combined. Tumblr, he's like, why? I'm like, interest. They're building an interest graph, not a social graph. People change and you don't keep the same friends in high school and college and things of that nature, but the interest you're into stays with you. It's why I was so early on TikTok. When it was musically, I'm like, fuck, here it is. Remember when you were like, you're weird, you're going to jail, you're hanging out with all the 14 year old dancing girls? Yeah, yeah. Yep, so. <laughs> when that happened, I was like, this is it. This is what I was waiting for Tumblr to do. And so everything I just talked about in detail, is we are shifting to the interest graph, not the social graph, and it's a big opportunity for a lot of you. And if you're able to get good at the game I just laid out, I believe that is the moat, that is the arbitrage of the next half decade. People, oh, people overthink positioning. Like I talk a lot lately about don't be an expert, be an enthusiast. Everyone's losing in content right now because they're like, I'm an expert, and then we, are like, you're not, and it's over before you start. That's right. Right? I've never said I was an expert, and I actually am in the shit that I talk about. I did 15 years of wine before I talked, I did 40 fucking 30 years of business before I talked, and never say the word expert. Every, you know why? Because I'm not insecure about it, I am it. Everybody else. So practitioner would be the word that I would correct, about, right? Correct, right? I'm a practitioner. So what, practitioner. What, what I think you need to do is not worry about positioning. When, you know, back to, it's a, you write, too many people worry about the positioning because they think that's the thing that gets it done. It's not. It's the truth that gets things done. Whether you're an expert or enthusiast or influence, you know, people are like, I'm not an influencer. I'm like, cool. Like, people call me everything. You think I think I'm a fucking motivational speaker? I do not think I'm a motivational speaker. Do I think many people position me? Sure. All of it's irrelevant. It's all about what the actual truth is. You are actually not just a tenant. You are a beacon of the community. You are, you're all these things. And when you start talking, then things happen. Yeah. I was on two meetings, I'll give you an example. I was on two meetings today, both which were clients that don't know me. They know my teams. I was in two of them today, which is not that often, by the way, that this happens. We're getting bigger and bigger and bigger where I'm not the only one selling clients in, and I rarely service clients. So I was in two, ironically today, it made me think of it. Do you know what my takeaway was from both meetings? Oh shit, Gary really knows what the fuck he's talking about. He's not just the mascot of this company. That wasn't me positioning. I didn't start the meeting with like, I'm the CEO. Like, I just talked for 30 minutes or went back and forth. Get a seat at the table with no positioning. I'm JD. That's mother- what it is. Right, That's I'm right. JD, yeah. motherfucker. That's who I am. But when you that talk, works for me actually, so I know it does. I just also often but you gotta like remember. We'll also ask you to leave. <laughs> That's fine too. But you gotta remember for all of you and for everybody who's watching at home, if they were able to watch this, it's it doesn't matter what your title says. It matters what you do. Do you mm-hmm. when you say something? Do you back it up? And so. Don't overstress how you're positioned, just talk that talk. Here's why it works. If they're smart, they'll know. I win with smart winners, and I lose with dopey losers. If somebody's confused about my merits after I'm done talking about a subject, that's not on me, that's on them. And honestly, I use it as a filter for me. When, and by the way, yeah. sometimes it doesn't land for me. And I walk out and be like, because I never talk from any about anything other than exactly what I know. So if it doesn't land, there's some political reasons they don't want to hire us or work with me or like right. what I said. There's some other things going on. That's not my worry. I'm not in the business of convincing. I just move on. That's that's great. That's very encouraging. That's actually true to my actual way. But I just feel like I've been beating on these doors so long. I'm like, I'm, it's I get frustrating, it. right? I, listen, and, and I, I continue to be talked about as the wine guy, an influencer, a motivational speaker, and I'm building some of the biggest businesses. Like, 
I'm building the most successful advertising agency in the world. Nobody even knows I have a job. Everyone's like, what Gar- one of the top 10 searches is, does, what does Gary Vee actually do? <laughs> like, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, so like, fuck that noise. Like, people are gonna judge, you know, I, you know, like, it's irrelevant what people think uh, when, before you start talking. It's important what people think after you're done talking your truth. Sometimes it's not gonna land because they don't care what you have to say. They have a financial incentive, a political incentive. Uh, they've already decided who they want to play your role and that's just life. Yeah, awesome. I mean, really we, we lost the recent, I'll give you a good one. We lost the recent pitch. It was fire, I was so proud of my team. And like, I was baffled by it for a few minutes and then like somebody walked by and was like, oh, the agency they picked is the son-in-law of one of the partners. Oh my God. They just had to have the two oh other bids or whatever. Yeah, I'm like, I wish we knew that before we put in that work, but cool, right. like Mazel Tov. Like that's, of course, like that doesn't bother me at all. That's life. So that, all right. The same great things that could happen to you on TikTok, which is just so everybody knows, your brand might not have a TikTok presence. You decided this talk inspired you to maybe instead of no. Your first post can do well. That was unheard of for a decade. For a decade you had to spend ungodly amounts of energy and effort to build a list, followers, to give you a chance. Now the creative is the variable, not your ability to build followers. This is a That's, fun, the biggest, that's, that's the massive, biggest. it's massive. It would have been TikTok emphatically six months ago. The TikTokification is meta. I mean, Facebook Reels is performing better for me than anything. Facebook Reels. And that's because you're first in the pool. Yes, comma, the thing that's blown me away is 25 to 35 year olds. Like I don't even know any 25 to 35 year olds that are on Facebook, yet it's dominating for me against that segmentation. So meta has publicly said they're changing their algorithms to more interest than just followers and I think they're sandbagging how heavy they have to go to get there. Snap, I think is gonna get much more serious about spotlight, intuitively I believe that. YouTube Shorts, for a lot of businesses here, is actually probably the most interesting because if you know how to name and title your creative, it also shows up in the search engine and YouTube's the second biggest search engine in the world. For a lot of you, that's where you can showcase your products. There's a lot there. So I would argue YouTube Shorts is incredibly interesting. Twitter has announced that they're gonna make a much bigger play towards the creative. So, I, you know, I would say six months ago, it was pot committed TikTok. I would argue that they're all going through the merit of the creative is the distribution now. And so all of them, and because the best of the best are so focused on TikTok, there might be even more arbitrage in YouTube Shorts or Facebook Reels and things of that nature.